Hello, uh, good morning and uh, welcome um, to this uh, webinar at DIES uh, with Minister of National Defense from Portugal, Rao Gomes Cravinho, in conversation with DIES researchers, Christine Nissen, Jessica Larsen and Mikkel Runge Olesen, all national experts on European security and NATO. My name is Cecilia Felicia Stockholm Banke. I am uh, the head of research unit in foreign policy and diplomacy at DIES. I'm delighted uh, that we are able to do this uh, webinar with you, Minister. Uh, um, the theme of the webinar is Portugal, EU, and the future of wider European security, which is indeed a subject of certain um, relevance. Um, Minister, it is a great pleasure to do this webinar with you. Uh, you hold a PhD in political science from Oxford University, and you are a former diplomat uh, serving, among others, as EU ambassador to Brazil. Portugal just took over the presidency um, of the EU Council. Thus, we are very uh, curious uh, to hear about the priorities of your country's presidency of the EU when it comes to EU security and defense policy. We have a tight schedule for today's webinar uh, and we will start with you, Minister, uh, please, uh, if you um, will take the floor, so to speak, uh, and tell us a little bit about your uh, priorities, then you will be followed by uh, our uh, three researchers. Please, Minister. I uh, don't think we have, you are unmuted, I think. Okay, and what okay, about now? Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, well, that's my first uh, comment. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to um, be here in the webinar with you, although I would prefer to be in Copenhagen. Uh, but that's, uh, this is the world we are living in currently. I had a nice little quote here from Hans Christian Andersen, who said that to travel is to live. And uh, he traveled to Portugal and enjoyed his uh, time here. He wrote very nicely about Portugal, but um, uh, it would be, it's nice to, to remember him in these days that uh, we are forced to travel only, only mentally. But anyway, it's good, to, it's good to be with you and it's good to be able to exchange some ideas with, uh, with, uh, with you, with the Danish Institute for International Affairs. For us, obviously, um, I mean, in general, but particularly in the role of uh, presidency of the EU, it's very, very important to be touching base with the different parts of, of the European Union and understanding the different um, types of ideas that are coming from, from different corners of Europe. Um, so what I would like to, to do over, over 10 minutes, uh, and I'm going to try to be disciplined and taking off my watch to be able to look at it here, uh, is, is to just look at some of our uh, priorities and to make a few general considerations about where we are in the European defense identity. And, um, and then, of course, uh, to be available to, 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 to your comments and, and questions. First point is to say that I think that it is important to recognize that we've come a tremendously long distance over the past uh, few years. Uh, the focus tends to be on, on our differences, on where there are divergences between the uh, member states, and and that's fair enough because that's where we need to work on. That those are the areas where we need to to make further progress. But uh, but it is important to contextualize and to say that in fact, you know, the the differences are are greatly exaggerated to a, to a very important degree. We have a a level of convergence amongst us 27 that allow us to be ambitious. Most importantly, we share the same fundamental values. We share the same uh, sense of what we want Europe to be over the next over the next uh, years, decades. The uh, next semester or this semester is a semester in which uh, Portugal has 
the responsibility that comes with the chair. And I think the responsibility is always a dual one. Uh, firstly, to advance the general um, agenda that, that we all share and to ensure that during our presidency, uh, we advance as much as possible in all of the areas where it is possible to advance. So this is something that uh, is, a, is a generic responsibility of all, um, of all member states that have the presidency. And then, of course, it is always an occasion uh, to put forward what we believe to be some of the value-added aspects uh, that we can bring. And that's one of the, the beauties of the European Union is particularly that, that uh, each country brings its own value-added uh, during these, these moments of the semester. There's a limited uh, capacity uh, for doing this, of course, um, but, but I think, do think that we have some aspects that we can, that we can put forward. Uh, in particular, I would like to, in this respect, uh, make reference to cooperation with Africa, that I'll say a couple of words about, and also to uh, maritime security. Um, I'd, I'd start, though, with the uh, EU-NATO uh, relationship, because this is, this is one of the areas of work uh, over the past couple of years, and one that we need to, uh, to develop further, to deepen in the, next, in the next couple of years. Portugal is deeply European and deeply Atlanticist. So we're in a good position as regards that. You know, we're here. I, I, as I look out over there, uh, look out of the window, I'm seeing the mouth of the River Tagus opening up into the, into the Atlantic. And so, uh, you know, geography is destiny in some respects anyway. And uh, uh, I don't think that anybody has any doubts about our European commitments to the deepening of a European defense identity and nor uh, about our Atlantic dimension. And so that puts us in a fairly good position, I think. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think that, you know, we were all very much aware the, of the transition happening this week in, in Washington, and we have to take advantage of that. This is a, a new opening. Uh, it is not a return to the past. It is not a return to the, uh, the years of Bill Clinton and, and, and Obama, uh, but it is uh, an opportunity to um, enter into a deep dialogue based on a mutual uh, recognition of the importance of a multilateral rules-based order. Uh, and I think that uh, the Biden administration brings with it an instinctive understanding of the, of the European Union as an ally, which is, of course, a major departure from the years of the Trump administration, and we need to take advantage of that. Um, taking advantage of that means uh, helping the incoming administration in Washington to understand that strategic autonomy of Europe is not a strategic autonomy from the United States, from NATO. It's a strategic autonomy for. It's a strategic autonomy to enable us to be better, closer partners uh, of the United States, to uh, work on the transatlantic relationship or to bring greater value added to the transatlantic relationship. That's, that's a challenge because there are going to be elements of divergence there. But um, uh, overall, I think that we are in a position where we, we should be able to make that, make that case and uh, to explain that there are moments when either there is no consensus or no desire for NATO, to have a mission in which the European Union needs to have the elements that allow it to develop its own, uh, its own missions. So uh, the EU-NATO uh, dialogue is closely linked, of course, to the uh, transatlantic dialogue, to the dialogue between the EU and the incoming US administration. And I want to be able to use the informal defense ministers meeting the beginning of March to have an important um, first encounter with the uh, with the, 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 the officials responsible on the other side of the Atlantic for this in order to um, lay the groundwork for a later uh, EU-US uh, summit and also, of course, a NATO summit, both of which we expect to be happening during this semester. A couple of words on, on Africa and also on maritime security. Both of these I mentioned as areas of, of value added for us. Um, 
I think that one of the things that has changed in the two and a bit years since I became defense minister uh, is that uh, towards the end of 2018, my first impressions were of a Europe that was quite divided between the countries of the North that were not very interested in Africa and the countries of of, uh, of the South that, uh, that were more interested. I don't know if that's a mischaracterization. What is clear to me is that today, uh, there is a generalized throughout Europe recognition of the importance of, for example, stability in the Sahel. Uh, there is a generalized recognition that this is not some niche of uh, particular concern just to countries that are geographically closer, but actually uh, a major area of um, commitment that the European Union needs to be able to, to respond to. What, what we have uh, at the moment five out of our six CSTP missions are in, uh, in Africa. But I think one thing that we're missing is a level of political dialogue with African actors that is at the same level as our military and financial commitment. And so one of the um, elements that I would like to develop during the uh, informal defense ministers meeting is a dialogue uh, with African ministers, uh, bringing them to, to Lisbon to meet with their uh, uh, European counterparts, in order for us to be able to get greater political leverage out of our um, CSDP uh, missions. They cannot be seen purely as technical missions. They are political commitments. And, uh, and this requires us to be able to engage better, more deeply with African interlocutors who are committed to the same uh, issues solving the, uh, the problems in Central African Republic or in Mali uh, or in Somalia, for example. So dialogue, political level dialogue with, uh, with African counterparts. With respect to uh, maritime security, the development of a European defense identity has very much been uh, a land-based uh, identity. And yet I think that uh, Europe, uh, as it deepens its sense of itself as an actor in this um, era of multipolarity, needs to add a maritime dimension to this. We, we shouldn't forget that, of course, we are a great trading bloc, and indeed, this is something that Denmark and Portugal share, because our history has been very much about, um, about, uh, about uh, using our maritime connections for uh, promoting our, our trade engagements. And for the European Union, 80% of our external trade happens by, uh, by sea. Even 40% of our internal, internal intra-European trade happens by sea. We have uh, um, massively important sea line lines of communication, uh, sea, um, the bed lines of communication. So all of the underwater cables that take the digital communication across the Atlantic and to different parts of the world, down the African coast and so on. This uh, opens up a new area uh, of vulnerability for us as Europeans. We need to be able to uh, be thinking of ourselves um, beyond the Mediterranean as uh, having some kind of maritime uh, presence. And during our six months, uh, one of the aims that we have is to consolidate what we call the coordinated maritime presences, which is the notion that many various European countries, Portugal twice a year sends uh, ships down the African coast uh, on patrolling missions. Um, uh, various other European countries do this. And so what we're going to do with the coordinated maritime presences is organize ourselves so that in terms of calendar and in terms of passing of information from one ship to another, we manage to develop a kind of permanent European presence. This is not an EU mission. It's a mission that is coordinated within the EU, but it's a mission of uh, individual member states who, who are doing this anyway, and who um, I believe would gain enormously by, for example, in the Gulf of Guinea, which is where we want to do the pilot project, um, by having a permanent European presence, permanently exchanging, updating information, and uh, in helping to ensure that that region, 
which is where 90% of uh, piracy attacks worldwide uh, happen, um, which was completely different from a situation a few years ago when piracy was mostly in the South China Sea or the, or the uh, Indian Ocean, um, ensuring that we have a permanent European presence. That, for me, is an embryo of a European maritime uh, strategy that, uh, that, can have some, that can have some significance. Um, there are other aspects of this, uh, namely work with uh, the Friends of the Gulf of Guinea, which is a group of uh, countries dedicated to promoting um, stability in the Gulf of Guinea, and that we, were going to, we, will, that we will take to our formal defense ministers meeting in, in May, so that we have meetings with ministers from those, uh, those countries. But, um, but this, is, this is, I think, something that is like we would like to see start during our presidency and develop over the next few years. Finally, a few words, because I'm trying not to go too much over time, on the strategic compass. Firstly, to say that this is, in fact, a very important document. We have the global strategy of 2016. And then in practical terms, we have our CSDP missions, but we don't really have any um, document, any overarching strategic document that allows us to go from A to B, that allows us to really establish what we want to achieve in terms of CSDP missions that are relevant for our global strategy. So the, the strategic compass, I think, can be a major contributor to the European defense identity. The German presidency, during the German presidency, we saw a very important advance, which is for the first time the, the threat, a joint uh, threat assessment. Uh, it's, uh, it's an important document. And um, that joint threat assessment has led to, um, since then, there will be many contributions by member states uh, making different suggestions about it. And in next month, in February, we should have a scoping paper that will allow us really to identify what we can achieve in each of the different four pillars of the strategic compass. I think that the biggest risk that we run with respect to the development of the strategic compass is that it should become a document that uh, has such a level of generality that it says um, nothing that anybody would disagree with and, and really doesn't actually help us to go much further down the road. And so what I want to do during our presidency is really bring in a, a level of um, a political contribution uh, to this, perhaps some controversy because if there is no controversy, that's a sure sign that the document is not going to be very interesting. And of course, we need to be able to go beyond the controversy. We need to be able to build the bridges, uh, but, but we need to tackle some of the difficult issues uh, that we face in terms of our ambitions as EU. And so during the presidency, what I would like to do is to encourage the work that is happening at the technical level, at the, at the level of the external action service and the different defense ministries and foreign ministries uh, of the European Union, but at the same time, bring in the political um, discussion that uh, hopefully will allow us to touch upon some of the more sensitive uh, issues. Relations with NATO is going to be one of them. Um, the balance between a southward looking Europe and uh, an eastward looking or southeastern looking Europe. Uh, what we want to, what kind, whether we are a regional power or we want to have a global uh, significance, these are some of the more um, substantive issues that we will have to face up to collectively. I've, I'm, I've overrun my time a little bit, so I apologize for that, but I hope that those, some, those elements will allow for, for some discussion and I, I look forward to the remainder of the of the of the seminar. Thank you, the webinar. Thank you, indeed, Minister. Extremely interesting, uh, 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 both um, what you said about the level of political dialogue with African leaders. You talked about maritime security, uh, and finally, you talked about the strategic compass. And in when you started your talk, you also. You open up by saying this is a new beginning. We have a chance here uh, with in with regards to the transatlantic relationship. And um, now uh, following your um, talk here or short intervention, we have a series of questions coming from 
a, a three of my colleagues and, and the first series of questions come from uh, Christine Nissen, who is an expert on uh, CSTP, uh, European uh, Security and Defense Policy. And she will uh, uh, go deeper into uh, that particular uh, aspect of your uh, talk here. So please, Christine. Christine. Thank you, Cecilia, and thank you uh, very much, Minister, for your, uh, yeah, indeed, extremely interesting and, and concrete uh, presentation and for being here with us today. Um, also, congratulations on the Portugal's uh, EU presidency. We look very much forward to, to following, um, to follow your important work in, in the next month. Um, one of the priorities um, in the program for the Portuguese EU um, presidency is ambition to, to promote a global uh, Europe, as you call it. And indeed, in the, in the turbulent times uh, of the world of today, calls for a, a European response on the international stage and, and preferably a united one. Um, you also mentioned um, strategic autonomy in uh, your presentation. And, and indeed, uh, this term, strategic autonomy, is, is becoming a popular way of, of describing that the EU should be able to do more on the international stage uh, and uh, not least uh, be able to take care of its own uh, security. Um, and while this term is becoming very popular, um, its definition is, is not so clear. Uh, whether the, the term is, is used in many different ways. Um, and I would therefore like to ask you um, more about how Portugal understands this term of strategic autonomy. You already mentioned that strategic autonomy has to be that the EU is, is not autonomous from someone, uh, but autonomous to do something. Um, but I would like to, to hear more of how you understand the word and, and also what Portugal can do to, to indeed make the EU more strategic autonomous. Thanks. Am I being heard? No. Yes? Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you for that. Yes. Um, strategic autonomy has, uh, is a term that has uh, been uh, divisive uh, in the past. And it's a term that I have not uh, much used, but I, I think we have developed a sufficient level of maturity now uh, uh, to overcome some of the issues with, uh, with, with the terminology. And therefore, I find that I'm more comfortable using the expression now than I was a year ago. Not that I had any problems with it. It's just that, it's just that uh, I found that um, it was not helpful to be using the term because uh, it uh, raised too many uh, questions in the minds of some of uh, our uh, EU partners. I think we've gone a little bit beyond that. I, I did mention, um, and, and to, to start off with, the notion that strategic autonomy, must, it was, it's a question of prepositions. It's, it's not from, it's for. But what does that mean in practice? <coughs> Excuse me. In practice, that means that for the foreseeable future, NATO uh, remains for 22 out of the 27 member states of the European Union, 22 who are members of NATO, it remains the cornerstone of our collective defense. We do not see uh, in the for, for the foreseeable future, meaning for the next few years, any alternative developing <clears throat> to inside, inside Europe to the most uh, fundamental, um, uh, as a most fundamental line of defense for, for the Europe faced with an existential threat. At the same time, we've seen tremendous tumultuousness in NATO uh, as a result of the Trump administration over the last uh, four years. And if the Trump administration had continued for four more years, I think there would be very, very serious questions as to whether NATO itself would survive. In these circumstances, evidently, we uh, have to be doing two things. We have to deepen our European defense identity because it is with 
our European Union partners that uh, we, again, geography is destiny, that we uh, are, will be able to, to find um, for, imagine, try to imagine the scenario in 50 years time. I believe that it is with our European Union partners that we will be able to find the deepest partnership in terms of defense. I hope that it will also be with the transatlantic relationship. But after the four years of the Trump administration, I think that it is not reasonable to say that uh, we can be confident that for ever and ever, uh, we are going to have a NATO that, um, that, that corresponds to what it is today. So the European defense identity must do two things. It must be capable of projecting itself during this um, period in which we have NATO as the cornerstone of our defense. And hopefully, it will be able to do so in a manner that helps NATO to be the cornerstone of our defense for the foreseeable future. At the same time, it must also be uh, developed as an insurance policy. The first one, what the first one means is that in, we must, at the European level, be capable of developing mechanisms that allow us to respond to some of our immediate defense and security challenges. And when I talk of the Sahel, um, I can't really see that it makes too much sense for NATO involvement, although I would be very happy for NATO to continue, for example, to contribute intelligence and to offer some kind of uh, support in, uh, in, in cases where it might, might be necessary logistically. But I don't see uh, the idea of a NATO mission in Sahel developing uh, very, very easily. On the other hand, it's clear that for the European Union, we have uh, the requirement to be present, and that means that we need to have uh, greater autonomy in order to be able to fulfill these responsibilities. Um, secondly, strategic autonomy also has to uh, allow us, I think, to be able to interact with uh, other partners on global issues. I mentioned maritime uh, security. Now, what we are seeing in the Atlantic and, and Denmark being placed uh, where it is, 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 is in a privileged position to observe this, is much intensified Russian uh, activity coming from the Arctic and also, of course, now coming from the Black Sea uh, with, uh, with Russia's new uh, capacity to, to, to uh, project itself uh, through the Mediterranean. And we are seeing also increased uh, activity uh, by China. Now, I don't see China and Russia acting in the same way, but it is also clear that the development of the Chinese Navy on the scale that is happening very quickly um, is, is for it to go somewhere. And in that sense, it uh, seems to me that the European Union needs to be able to partner with the United States uh, in NATO, of course, and beyond NATO, uh, in terms of ensuring that the Atlantic remains an area of, of um, uh, free trade and, uh, and, and, uh, and peace and stability. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll finish in a moment, uh, Christine, just to say that uh, I think that strategic autonomy does require us to live up to uh, our ambitions in various new areas. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, talking about partnerships and, and deepening our European identity, as you mentioned, um, when we discuss increasing uh, European strategic autonomy, I, I think that it would be interesting to also hear your view on the issue of Brexit in that discussion. Uh, because as, at a time where, where the EU wants to, um, to strengthen its global presence, the UK is, uh, is the partner, obviously, uh, uh, one of the partners with the most experience uh, in security and defense issues, and, and they've now left the EU. 
Uh, and while the UK um, has perhaps not been the most sort of driven supporter of a strong, um, deep uh, uh, European uh, um, identity uh, within the EU framework, um, the, the, the British have now said that they, they wish for a very strong uh, partnership with the EU um, once they leave or now that they, they have left. And this is, of course, a very positive thing, um, but the EU also needs to, to ensure a balance uh, between the sort of leverage of those who are in and, and those who are out. Uh, and I see that you mentioned uh, in your program too, uh, the, the EU's future relationship with, uh, with the UK. Um, and the words you use here are, are very diplomatic. Uh, the presidency will promote a comprehensive, fair and balanced partnership that respects both the interest of the UK and, it, and its member states. And, um, and I know that you're a former diplomat, uh, but, but I would ask you perhaps to be a little less diplomatic in answering how we, we strike a balance between having a close uh, EU-UK partnership uh, on security and defense without compromising sort of the integrity of, of the EU uh, decision-making system. Uh, so can you tell us a bit more about sort of uh, your goals uh, on the future EU-UK relationship um, when it comes to security and defense, and perhaps also what you see as the biggest hurdles in achieving such uh, goals? Great. Um, again, uh, here I think that we need to be looking at the following. Firstly, the agreement that was so, uh, so with such difficulty extracted uh, in the negotiations with the United Kingdom at the end of uh, last year is an agreement that does not cover security and defense. And, and this was uh, purposeful. The idea was that security and defense needs to come at a second stage. And this is uh, the stage we are at now. We need to be now working with the UK. I think that we have a very good um, uh, starting point, which is that uh, geostrategically, the UK is not going anywhere different. The UK uh, has, I believe, done enormous damage to itself with Brexit. Um, and, uh, but in the field of security and defense, we want the UK, on the one hand, to continue to be an extremely active role of the overall transatlantic relationship. And of course, I mean NATO, but I also mean the relationship between uh, the US and, uh, and Europe. Britain is is a part of of that relationship and should and should remain that way, and we want the UK to be uh, a, a partner with whom we work very closely in terms of strictly European um, uh, missions or or areas of interest. Again, Sahel comes to mind, but but others. Um, geographically and from the point of view of its own defense uh, priorities, the, the, the UK uh, must remain close to, to Europe. Uh, it will be a different Europe from the one that the UK participated in. And in many respects, it will be a Europe with a greater, deeper defense integration than the one that the UK would, uh, would like. But that's no longer a concern for the for, for the UK. That's that's now our issue, and we are moving ahead at, uh, at our own pace. And so, uh, what what I what I see happening is that we will have mechanisms that are not strictly either NATO or EU. We will have mechanisms. We already have one, which is the European Intervention Initiative, which will bring together. Uh, European and, or rather, uh, EU, non-EU, NATO, non-NATO uh, member states, according to the nature of the problem. And uh, the European Intervention Initiative is, is interesting because it is allowing for the development of a common strategic culture between a group of countries, including uh, Portugal and Denmark, but also Norway, uh, which is, of course, not an EU member state, UK, which is no longer... Um, and um, uh, uh, countries which are not NATO, countries like um, uh, Finland and Sweden. So, uh, and they are countries, all countries who have said, we are willing to go deeper 
not in pooling our defense and sharing it, not in creating some kind of common European uh, armed forces, but in uh, bringing our uh, national armed forces into a, um, a strategic uh, convergence in order to be able to operate in different uh, circumstances. So I think that this is the way to go with the UK, is to establish a general set of principles but uh, for, for our cooperation. And I don't think this should be too difficult. Um, UK may uh, well, for example, want to continue involved under European flag in, in, um, in the Balkans in the future or uh, other areas. And in uh, different uh, missions, it may want to simply be side by side with framework agreements like we have with, with other countries, whereby we have a European mission, but we have um, members of uh, participation from non-EU countries. So this is uh, an area of work that is very going to be very interesting for the next year. I don't think it's going to be profoundly difficult because I don't see great divergences between UK and Europe in terms of our geostrategic uh, orientation. Thank you very much. Um, I could ask you a lot of uh, more and more questions, uh, but but I think I will um, give you hand you over to my colleague uh, Jessica uh, to to hear more about uh, Portugal's uh, maritime security uh, visions for uh, the EU. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, thank you, and good day to you, um, Minister, and of course to all the viewers. My name is Jessica Larson. I'm a researcher at DIES, uh, focusing on maritime security. Um, you've already spoken a lot about maritime security, and I would like to commend you for having that as a priority in the Portuguese presidency. I'd like to, to take you to West Africa, if you don't mind, to the Gulf of Guinea and the problem of piracy, uh, kidnapped yes. ransom. You already mentioned that uh, Somali piracy in the 2000s were, was the, the, the serious issue in terms of maritime security, and now it's the Gulf of Guinea that produces the highest number of attacks. Um, last year, the numbers just came. It was more than 95% of attacks that occurred in the Gulf of Guinea. Um, um, so it, it is the most dangerous waters in the world. And within the last couple of months, three Danish ships uh, were attacked. Now, the EU is addressing this in the Gulf of Guinea, including uh, several member states here in the Portugal, Denmark, and also France. And for a decade, these donors have been supporting um, the rolling out of the so-called Yaoundé Code of Conduct, which is basically this very comprehensive maritime security infrastructure to deal with uh, maritime crime in the region through capacity building, maritime domain awareness, training exercises. And yet it remains a high risk area. I was um, participating in the so-called G7 plus plus Friends of Gulf of Guinea meeting, which is a forum that gathers together international and regional actors to discuss um, how to enhance maritime security in the region. And the shipping industry was very impatient. They were saying, you have the assets in the region, you have maritime domain awareness, situational awareness, the law, the legal structures are in place in many of these countries, where are the results? So could you tell us a bit more about how Portugal will engage the issue of maritime security and piracy in particular in the Gulf of Guinea and also explain how you would respond to the industry. Do you see an option for EU seeking um, to engage in the region through more active European naval presence? Portugal is already there. You mentioned the coordinated maritime presence. However, as I understand that, it's an information sharing capacity on a more strategic level than actually um, engaging in, 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 in sharp operations. Um, and this, this issue about um, military presence, I think, is of particular importance uh, to a Danish audience because our Minister of Defense has, over the last months, been trying to, to gain support for this option of military presence in the region so far with uh, little success. And, and yesterday it was made public that we're sending a special representative to the region to try to push this agenda forward. So if you could, could talk a little bit about uh, this, how, how you re respond to the industry, what Portugal will, will do to create um, safety um, at sea for seafarers, and then also um, how you view uh, um, 
increased military uh, engagement in the Gulf of Guinea. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, I, and thanks for the information on uh, 2020 figures, 95%. I mean, it says it all. Uh, and I only had the figures from uh, 2019, which were 90%, so it's getting, it's getting worse. And we know that uh, also because we, we have experience of uh, the incidents that are happening uh, regularly. And of course, uh, Denmark well, it has a very major Danish company, Maersk, uh, which is responsible for so much international shipping and, and of course, uh, therefore vulnerable to these attacks. And um, uh, we have a permanent uh, ship permanently based in uh, Santo Tome and Principe, uh, which, uh, which is occasionally called out to offer uh, support, uh, most recently to a Chinese ship that had been, uh, that had been uh, was assaulted by pirates and a number of members of the crew taken hostage. The uh, coordinated maritime presence is is not just uh, about strategic information sharing. It is very much, the idea is to coordinate not only uh, information, but also calendars of, um, of, of, of passage in the region. Um, so on the one hand, you, have, um, you will have ships, uh, European ships, uh, that uh, are receiving information from other European ships that have been there before them, and on the other hand, you have a distribution in time, which allows us for a certain level of, of permanence. And uh, according to the standard rules of engagement that we're all operating under, uh, essentially, if uh, we are within range of an incident, then uh, we will be called upon to, to, to act. So it's not only strategic information sharing, it's also allowing for um, for uh, our, uh, our, our, our different ships uh, that are traveling in the region, that are on missions, to be able to be uh, active in, in responding. Now, that does not mean a, an EU mission uh, patrolling the waters of the Gulf of Guinea. It's not the same thing as Operation Atalanta in the Indian Ocean. Operation Atalanta in the Indian Ocean was uh, developed at a certain time in 2011, I think, uh, 2010, uh, and uh, it was extremely effective. The problem, of course, is that the pirates, they are all born on land. The problem comes from the land. And uh, in uh, the tremendous instability that you have, and lack of, on the one hand, instability in, the, in, in a number of countries in the region, and on the other hand, a lack of capacity of their navies to patrol uh, coastal waters means that uh, this it is not going to be the coordinated maritime presences of European uh, navies that is going to be able to stamp out the problem. Um, I think that what we need to be doing is to be operating at different levels. Yaoundé gives us a good infrastructure for that, but uh, we are developing on a national basis, but uh, we want this to be something that is shared by EU and, uh, and, and non-EU countries, in fact, by countries to the north of the North Atlantic and in the South Atlantic and East and West Atlantic. We're developing something we call the Atlantic Center in the Azores. The Atlantic Center, the idea is to uh, have it as a base for three levels of work. Uh, political dialogue bringing together, there is no context nowadays in which we bring together decision makers uh, around the Atlantic. Uh, the North and the South Atlantic have always been separated and, and we don't also have much interaction between East and West Atlantic. So political interaction. Then think tank work, helping us to understand the different dynamics and problems. That's the second level of interaction. Thirdly, very uh, practical training uh, for capacity building, for uh, naval capacity, uh, particularly in the region of the Gulf of Guinea, but also uh, further up on the West African uh, coast and further, uh, further down. And um, this is a long-term objective. Uh, now, I'm not going to say to the shipping industry, 
that you know in a few months we've got this all cleared up. But I can say that we are developing uh, a structure both with the Atlantic Center and with the coordinated maritime presences that uh, will allow us to, to be in a much stronger position for responding to the problems. Whether there is a, a desire in the European Union to develop a mission like Atalanta is something that, I, it's not on the table right now, it may well come onto the table uh, in uh, at some later stage, but it would require, for example, a country such as Denmark or countries that have uh, strong interests in the area to be uh, actively promoting this. Of course, uh, Denmark's relationship, defense relationship with the European Union is a little bit different to, to others, but the Danish voice is always an important uh, voice, a relevant voice, and one with the, that we look forward to hearing uh, about in this, in this context. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, I see that we're almost running out of time, but I would really like to invite you to go further north with me now to the Mediterranean um, for a brief question before I, I hand over the floor um, about maritime security here, Mediterranean being the, the EU's southern border. We all know intimately the, the migration issues in this maritime domain. We also have Turkey, uh, Turkey's activities in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. There's of course the one Syria and, and Russia, um, Russian naval activities. There's, um, you also brought up uh, sea lines of communication, uh, underwater cables and the protection of those, which I'm very happy be, uh, that you mentioned because it's, it's often overlooked in discussions. There's illegal fishing. In other words, there's um, a very complex picture in the Mediterranean. I don't expect you to comment on all of it, but what we can say is that these issues require the activation of very different tools in the EU toolbox, be it uh, border management, crisis management, uh, political or, or diplomatic track um, and there's not agreement on what is the best way forward because some of these topics are very politically sensitive and also um, there are different uh, interests um, within the EU between uh, member states. Nevertheless, the EU is addressing some of the issues and so is NATO, for example, Operation Sea Guardian, which was supporting um, the EU on migration. So what role do you as defense minister holding the EU presidency wish uh, that the EU play in the Mediterranean? What are the priorities here among all these things? And how does it align with NATO, be it um, a division of labor, be it a collaboration? How do you see that? Thank you. Yeah, actually that's very interesting uh, well, set of points. And um, of course it's an enormously challenging region and we have, very different dynamics that are impacting upon upon different areas of the Mediterranean. I mean, you you didn't actually say the word, but of course Turkey uh, is 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 part of uh, what um, of what you what you were describing, and and the relationship there is a complex one in the Eastern Mediterranean, not only in the Eastern Mediterranean, Central Mediterranean as well. Um, the the uh, one uh, aspect that we can. I, expect, I, I hope make very concrete progress on is the uh, establishment of, um, of, of platform of understanding between NATO and the EU on uh, the relationship between Operation Sea Guardian and uh, Irini. Um, we have, uh, Portugal has a submarine that we want to, to double hat, that we want to be working for uh, Sea Guardian and uh, Irini. And I don't think that there is any incompatibility there. We just need to uh, establish who does what and, and how it operates. And I think that by doing so, we would be actually making a very important contribution to EU uh, NATO practical arrangements. Another aspect that I, I would wanted to mention is that Fortunately, we have seen in the last um, few weeks uh, ceasefire holding in Libya. It's, it's fragile, but, uh, but it's been holding. And it's very important as EU uh, that the Libyan process, if we manage to have a peaceful process set in March, um, inevitably the EU will have to play a role there. And it will play a role, I hope, that should be partly land, land on land and partly also on um, uh, in the water, and uh, there 
we need to go further than Irini. Irini uh, will need to respond to the changing circumstances uh, on land. Uh, above all, we do not see, border management is very important, but we do not see um, uh, the Irini as essentially about uh, ensuring that uh, refugees uh, fail to be able to take refuge. That is not some sort of the way that we can uh, contemplate the use of uh, EU uh, assets. We have to have a deeper, wider understanding of the way that the, our assets, our naval assets are used in order to project power. And it's not uh, just about uh, keeping refugees at sea. So in, in short, that's an, it's a an complicated area of work, but it's, uh, you know, if we don't manage to prove our worth in the Mediterranean, then what hope can we have of going further afield? Very well put, uh, Minister. Thank you so much for your reflections on these very complicated issues. And um, in the interest of time, I'm going to hand the floor over to my colleague, Miguel Runge Olsen. And Minister, um, good luck with the presidency. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Minister, for being with us here today. My name is Mikkel Rong Olsen, and I'm a senior researcher here at DEES, dealing with, among other things, transatlantic relations and NATO. Now, as you mentioned in your initial presentation, tomorrow marks the inauguration of Joe Biden as president uh, of the United States. And on that basis, I, I would like to shift focus a little bit away from EU and the maritime and towards NATO and transatlantic relations. Now, uh, much as is the case with this country, transatlantic relations have occupied a very important place in Portuguese security policy since the formation of NATO. However, under Trump, there has been some friction, which you yourself also hinted at in your presentation. Uh, and one, one example of, of, of such friction uh, that I also wanted to, 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 to ask you a little bit about is, is, is when it comes to US-Portuguese relations, uh, uh, also dealing with China. In an interview with the Portuguese newspaper Expresso, published on, in September 2020, the US ambassador to Portugal, George Glass, said that the Portuguese have to choose between its allies and the Chinese. Uh, and he warned that choosing China on 5G um, uh, may have consequences for Portugal, uh, such as the defense relationship between the two countries. And on that basis, I'd like to ask, how would you characterize the current US-Portuguese bilateral relationship as it has evolved under Trump, and how do you expect that relationship to develop under Biden, not least when it comes to balancing such a relationship against your economic relations with China? Okay, actually, uh, the US-Portuguese uh, relations uh, are much better than that interview uh, would allow one to imagine. It's rather a strange interview for a couple of reasons. Firstly, uh, U.S.-Portuguese relations during the last few years have been um, very good. Uh, we've had, you know, significant increase in our trade we've, and investment. We've had significant increase in our level of interaction, number of U.S. students coming to Portugal and Portuguese students. And all of these, these various uh, measuring sticks have, um, have all indicated actually very good uh, uh, U.S.-Portuguese uh, relations in the last few years. Um, so we uh, have not suffered in terms of our bilateral uh, relations with the more um, problematic wider geopolitical uh, uh, circumstances. Um, I think that uh, I had the opportunity to, 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 to speak with the the European Union ambassadors uh, shortly after this interview. And uh, what I told them at the time was, look, we, we should distinguish form and uh, substance. On the form, I mean, it's absurd. Uh, this is no way to, to treat uh, a sovereign nation. And, and I, I think that there was a, a great devaluing of the words because the form were quite, was quite inappropriate. In terms of the substance, it's also not the case that relations with China can be seen in a black and white perspective. On 5G, obviously, that we have uh, concerns and uh, we are very much following 
uh, what is being developed also by the European Commission on uh, concerns with relation to, to 5G. So, I mean, I wouldn't want to go further than that at the moment, but to say that this is something that is very much on our, on our radar. The, the important point, though, of course, goes well beyond 5G, and it is, should we see the uh, relationship with China as a relationship that is an adversarial relationship or one in which, and the truth is it's a bit of everything. We have, and I've made this point with American interlocutors on, on various uh, occasions, we have a major global existential threat, which is climate change. China has been a partner uh, on climate change. Not ideal, of course, but it has been a partner. It's been present. The US was not present for the last four years, and we very much welcome the return of the Biden administration to the Paris Agreement. So um, uh, we, we have, of course, deep uh, trade and economic uh, relations with China. COVID has also alerted us to the need to ensure that some of our um, strategic, we do not have a strategic dependence on any other part of the world. And a um, certain amount of very interesting work has taken place in Portugal and in other European countries and at the European level about increasing our strategic autonomy to return to that term that we talked about earlier, uh, also in the field of, of, uh, of economic and, uh, and trade relations. And, and then, yes, uh, there is no doubt whatsoever that China as an emerging power uh, presents us with very significant challenges. And I made a reference earlier to the enormous naval investment that China is, is making and the fact that, you know, soon we were going to have a Chinese Navy that is the same size or greater than the size of the United States Navy and therefore sailing somewhere and therefore fulfilling naval purposes. And so we should not be uh, blind to, to these realities. China is a, a multidimensional uh, challenge. And it is, um, uh, in some respects, a partner that we should be working with. In other respects, it is a, a country that we need to uh, understand, uh, whose intentions we need to understand better, particularly when it comes to, uh, to the Atlantic, for example. So relations with China, they're not black and white. Uh, they're a very significant part of what Europe needs to be asking itself. And, uh, and we need to be able to work with the US on relations with China, but that also requires the US not to present us with manichaeistic uh, options. Thank you very much for that. Um, I want to, to shift a little bit to another aspect of US-Portuguese relations, because uh, US-Portuguese relations, or many relations, and I think this is also the case again with Denmark, is also to some extent about real estate. And here, of course, I'm referring to the US base uh, Lages Fields at the Azores, which has been a prime geopolitical, uh, of prime geopolitical importance to the US since, well, all the way back to the First World War, really. Um, however, there has been recent US cutdowns uh, to the base, especially during the Obama years. Uh, also, we've seen obviously technology develop, uh, air-to-air -air refueling uh, and, and, and stuff like that, uh, which means that perhaps, or at least that where I would like to ask that uh, perhaps the base is not as vital as it once was. So on that basis, I would like to ask, uh, how do you see the future for largest field and uh, what do you think that will mean for US-Portuguese relations going forward? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's very interesting because uh, as you mentioned, during the, the Obama years, there was a certain level of disinvestment uh, in the Azores, which was a, a major uh, US uh, base. Um, and, uh, and it was vital uh, for, for US security, for transatlantic security. But technological developments meant that this no longer made as much uh, sense as it did in the past. However, since then, what we've seen in the last few years is the resurgence of the geopolitical centrality of the Atlantic. And, uh, you know, in a number of ways that I've already mentioned, from the, from the opening up of Arctic uh, lanes to uh, access from the, uh, from the Mediterranean for Russia, uh, to the uh, issues of the need to protect 
underwater lines of uh, communication, and to uh, the development of a very important Chinese Navy, which is happening rapidly. And so in the last couple of years, we have had interesting conversations with the Americans that are going in the opposite direction, which we're going in, going in the sense of saying, actually, the Azores, which has a unique geopolitical um, location, the Azores is it's the only thing right there in the middle of the North Atlantic. Um, uh, the Azores actually uh, cannot be thought of as just now something in the past. It actually probably has some future relevance, which is quite different from what we imagined a few years ago. So, um, uh, you know, uh, I don't, I can't really get too much into uh, details, so particularly now with the change of administration happening. But uh, except to say that with the outgoing administration, there was an interesting dialogue that was happening there. And uh, we expect that the uniqueness of the geopolitical location of the Azores will, will mean that it's not going to condemn to, to irrelevance as we once imagined 10, 15 years ago. Uh, I think, uh, Miguel. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Very yeah. good, uh, very interesting answer. We, we could talk much, much more about transatlantic yeah. relations. We, we are losing uh, Miguel. Uh, what direction it will go uh, go to? But but for now, uh, thank thank you for 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 your answers. I'll hand over the floor back to uh, Cecilia. Thank you. Uh, uh, Minister, thank you uh, so much for. Uh, some very interesting insights into uh, current uh, um, questions. And I wonder, because I was told here that we actually have you a few more minutes, if I may, if that is all right with you, because I've been dying to ask you this question since you in your introduction talked about the strategic compass. I'm a little curious about this compass also because I've been following that. Uh, and there was one thing you said, uh, which brought my attention and that is, uh, that you want to um, you want to have a discussion, and you also said there are some controversies about uh, the strategic compass and also the the threat uh, analysis or the level of threats. And I'm just I have to ask you, where do you see the controversies, and what is it that you kind of foresee would be some of the difficulties? Uh, and you were being very honest, saying we have to have this discussion, we need to be open about the controversies. So if I may ask you this last question also, thank you again for, for this extremely interesting insight. Please. Well, uh, the controversies are basically the ones that exist in the European Union amongst its 27 member states about uh, the role of Europe in the world, uh, how it relates to the US, NATO, and um, and what kind of ambition we should be, be having. Now. Uh, the, they're not necessarily great controversies currently in the uh, design of the strategic compass. Uh, but as I mentioned in my in earlier, um, one trap that we should avoid is making the strategic compass simply uh, a collection of banalities that everybody can sign up to, because that will not help us to go further down the road of uh, the European defense identity. So we must be able to discuss uh, those aspects that can be, can be more complicated for us to, to assume. For example, um, what is the nature of our, uh, at the defense level, of our relation with, uh, uh, with Russia? Do we have one at all? Is that simply a matter for, for NATO? Um, do, we, do, we, do we want? to engage with this issue or not. I'm open-minded about this, uh, but I th think that this is something that will elicit different responses from different European countries. And it would be good if we could develop uh, and have a discussion that would allow us to establish a consensus that is meaningful. Um, the same with respect to uh, east of, uh, east of the, the Suez Canal. Is there a role for Europe east of the Suez Canal or, 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 or not? And uh, if there is, what kind of role? Is it a role that is a secondary one exclusively based on partnerships with, uh, with other countries? Um, 
in terms of partnerships with other countries, do we, uh, are we interested or not in uh, following up what the United States is doing with Japan, Australia, and uh, India, uh, and Korea? Or, um, or, or, or do we uh, refrain from establishing a closer uh, relationship that could involve us in the dynamics of, uh, of Asian uh, disputes? Then there are uh, aspects that are related, of course, to, to the relationship uh, with, with NATO and the development of strategic autonomy, what exactly this, this can mean. Um, my, my basic point, though, is that it's actually not very difficult to write a strategic compass if we are not very ambitious about it. And I would like that during this uh, semester that we exercise some ambition in uh, bringing these uh, questions to, to, to the top. And maybe we will, in some respects, arrive at the conclusion that this or that aspect is not sufficiently mature for us to be able to go beyond a generic formulation. But in other aspects, I would believe that, uh, that we can, uh, if we are courageous enough to put them on the table, that we can actually produce a document that is more substantive. So uh, I think that the, 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 difference, uh, the different options that we face in terms of developing a strategic compass um, are, are, are those, and on our side, we're willing to go the more risky route uh, without losing sight of the objective, which is to, at the end of the day, have a, a document that we can all agree on. Right. Uh, thank you so much, and also thank you for allowing me to ask this question. Uh, thank you to my colleagues, uh, Christine Nissen, uh, uh, Jessica Larsen, uh, and Mikkel Runge, Mikkel Runge, Jessica Larsen, and Christine Nissen. Uh, Minister Carolino, this was a great pleasure uh, having this conversation and discussion with you. Uh, I'm sure my colleagues agree, uh, and uh, I understand that you need to rush now. Uh, so please, thank you so much, and uh, congratulations on your presidency. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the conversation and I look forward to uh, fulfilling uh, Hans Christian Andersen's uh, ideal of living in. Living I wanted in to thank you for that. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Very nice to, to be with you. Thanks. Bye bye. Pleasure. <laughs>